All welcome to one more show. Today I have a rock star who is back with us. He was with us a few weeks ago, a month ago. Dr. Daryl Demello from India. He has been managing COVID patients with a lot of success for months and months and months. So uh, I wanted to make sure that we can connect with him once more. We can figure out how Delta is going, how the management approaches, what kind of signs and symptoms he is seeing, and what is the uh, approach, and what is the condition with India. So, uh, and he has graciously uh, visited us again. He's here again. So, Dr. Demello, welcome. Thank you, Mobin. It's great to be with you. I enjoyed the first time, and I'm sure we'll all enjoy the second time. Absolutely. So for those who might listen to you only this time and have not seen a previous uh, talk, tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, I'm a I'm a, originally a physician, trained physician who who went into uh, pharmaceuticals and uh, initially as a medical advisor and medical services manager, and then went into management with devices and introduced new procedures like angioplasty and stenting and rotablator and intravascular ultrasound, not only to India, but also to around Asia and many parts of the world. And I've spent a fair amount of time in corporate, corporate America uh, right up till 2016. And I returned in 2017 and went back right into practice in India and have been practicing as a general, general practitioner, family practitioner, my uh, area of specialization in practice is more mainly dealing with corporate employees. So I work with corporates and I do see the average uh, person well, who walks you. in, but I mostly work with corporate employees to look after their health and make sure they're all well. Got it. Thank you very much. And for the cool beans here, for the audience here, please uh, make sure that you can uh, read, pause this video afterwards and read this description. Uh, Disclaimer, there is no medical advice here. I do not practice here in the US, so there is no advice in there. Dr. DeMello practices in India, so again, there is no advice here. This is more of an informational uh, session, and these are what all of our sessions have been. The point of the session today is to ask a physician who is working in India to see how their approach to the management of the COVID is. So once again, thank you very much for being here. Now let's start. I have been doing a discussion in multiple structures. The structures are number one, how do we keep our immune system as well running as possible to protect us? Then if we get COVID, what happens? If we ho we are hospitalized, what happens? How do we manage? What is about What about the long COVID or the post COVID syndromes? And I wanna start with this. And I want to show India's graph here too. One, how is the, with this graph in our mind, tell me what is your approach towards vaccines? Are the vaccines the first and important thing and then the remaining uh, management of it? What, what is your comment on that? Obviously, if you see that graph, that graph, the peak was sometime in April, okay? Uh, my my peak date was April 16th, where I had 1,400 phone calls. I missed 1,200 of those. I did return a lot of calls, but I missed 12, 1,200 of those, and that was pretty a pretty bad peak, where we were just we were I was drowning in cases, and uh, I saw the rise in the middle of February when I went from six cases a day to 22 cases a day all of a sudden, and it just kept kept rising and rising and rising till it peaked there. And then we saw a gradual decline, but the real fall off the cliff happened 15th of June, when suddenly it went from so many cases a day to boom, down to four, five. Today I average anywhere from four to six cases a day, new cases of COVID, and another five to six cases of long COVID or post COVID. Okay, somebody who's already had COVID who comes to me. I do a lot of advice of travel, prophylaxis, People are traveling abroad. People are traveling within the country. So I do give them my goal and my objective now going forward is uh, to help companies get back to work and uh, how we get back to work. I want to help open up the economy. I want to help open up 
companies so that they can bring the employees back at least to the amount that the government laws allow. And in many states, the government allows you to bring back 50% of your employees. And I would generally want them to bring their employees back to work. At the end of the day, that those, those individual interactions play a pretty high, high role in success of uh, the company and the company sales and company revenues and all that stuff. So client meetings are important. So my goal now is to try and educate and try and work with companies to bring their, their employees back and bring them back safely, put them on, on certain prophylaxis measures, make them follow certain steps. I call it COVID appropriate behavior. Uh, that cliff that you saw probably was because India finally went back to COVID appropriate behavior. Okay, there was a whole time where we were pretty much lost. We had lost the whole thing of COVID appropriate behavior. And uh, we saw that fall off the cliff because I think people went back to actually doing doing what is right, which is in wearing your mask up out when you're outside, uh, washing your hands, keeping your social distancing. So the government, the government, the governments, the state governments in, in India have done a, and the central government have done a great job uh, reinforcing the COVID appropriate behavior. So that's something that even at a corporate level, we look at and look at closely as to how, how to manage that in a, in a group setting. So it's been, it's been well, well organized, well documented that, that it can happen. There's no, Got without it. your mask, you want to wear a mask. I mean, I'm, I'm being very clear. Uh, if we are about five, seven percent vaccinated in India, hmm. we have first wave, we probably had 20 percent. Second wave, we probably had 18 percent. So 17, 18 percent, 19 percent. We're somewhere about that 38 uh, percent infected with natural infection which means people have immunity, okay, natural immunity derived from natural infection. So that with a vaccination has been, uh, but we are not anywhere near herd immunity status. And I'm going to say this, and I've said this, I'm going to say this again, and you'll always hear me say this. Everybody in the world is going to get COVID. Ideally, you want to get COVID the way I got it, asymptomatic. You want to get it without without any, any uh, symptoms. You want to get it. You want to make sure you are documented that you've had it and move on. Because once you have COVID, once you have the COVID infection and your immune system develops naturally, so natural immunity derived from natural infection, my prediction is that we'll probably have a long-term immunity. I'm looking at something like in excess of five years. I'm of the camp that, that talks about the immunity being towards the, the SARS virus. That's a coronavirus, which was now we're, we're going on 19 years from reinfection. Uh, not towards the flu virus scenario, okay? So, which is six months and one year. So, somewhere in between, whether it's two years, five years, ten years, I'm guessing it'll be more than five years, probably five to ten years immunity. But we will all have immunity, provided we get the infection. But to to reduce the severity, the the bottom line is you need to build up your immune system to reduce the severity of disease. There are two ways you can do it, or three ways you can do it: eat good food. Exercise, so eat good food and exercise is one thing. Take your vitamin D, stand in the sun, take your vitamin D, build up your vitamin D in your body. And third is get vaccinated. Vaccination will not protect you from getting uh, COVID. It will protect you uh, from the severity of disease. That's what we are told by the scientists. So we are now beginning to see that in countries like the UK, where the vaccinated are not, the they have lesser percentage of hospitalization lesser percentage of deaths than the unvaccinated. So vaccination versus un unvaccinated. I'm a vaccinated person. I'm not an anti-vax. I'm a very much, I manage vaccination camps. I've taken the vaccination. We are all in the process of getting it organized. Uh, it's about just making sure that everybody has some level of immunity. I've taken the vaccination despite being COVID uh, positive or being COVID antibody positive. So it's just to document that I, I believe in it, we will take it, we'll move it forward. So, so that's the way I want to put it uh, in place. Mubin? Right. Thank you very much. So, so vaccination is important to use or okay. get. What was the question? I missed, missed your question, Mubin. 
which uh, which vaccine if you don't mind uh, telling us which vaccine did you get okay we have we have two vaccines we got sputnik recently but we've we've had two commonly available vaccine covaxin and astrazeneca covishield my 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 major experience has been with the covishield vaccine i'm guessing about 80 85% of patients have been with the covishield which is the astrazeneca vaccine and less with the covaxin i personally have taken the covishield and so has my wife Got so it. we are when most of our family uh, have have also taken the covishield vaccine got and, it and full disclosure from my side as well uh, i have gotten my vaccine i got moderna my wife had uh, johnson one of my sons has pfizer and the other son had moderna yeah so we are all still well and i think it is an important thing to do right. let's move to the management so you are a physician you are you have your clinic somebody comes in they have covid symptoms how do you start number one what do you say for people to stay as healthy as possible as protected as possible what is that uh, advice and again the when i use the word advice here my apologies this is not an advice for people this is how dr demello advises his own patients yes right the the, the 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 what i suggest to people is to one is of course uh, follow covid appropriate behavior which means wear your mask wear your mask wear your mask and uh maintain social distancing and wash your hands regularly okay the second thing is i always encourage them to get a vitamin d test done so i want to know what their vitamin d levels are this is if they are they are pre covid if they haven't had covid even when they get covid if i can get a vitamin d test done i can actually reduce the severity of disease by giving them vitamin d and uh so depending again on their levels here we get the injectables we give them injectables or we give them orals and i try and maintain a level of vitamin d above 60 and less than 100 and people will ask me what is that number it is an ng by ml so let's it's not the 250 that's a different uh, measurement we do get the two kinds of measurements but uh, vitamin d is very very critical for maintaining your your immunity at a very high level if you are in that 70 80 90 range and as of as of uh, last week before i took the vaccine i got my complete body blood test done including the vitamin d test my vitamin d was 90 so i try and maintain mine in the 90s always maintain mine in the 90s and it's been very useful it helps me to uh, see patients at close quarters it helps me to go to their homes to covid patient homes i go there of course i wear my mask and i don't wear a pp kit but but i do go home visits i do home visits i treated people at home and my advice to them is just take care of your vitamin d uh, you'll be fine you know not and you you have to follow covid appropriate behavior so if you can do that you should be great some day they will get it you can you can run from covid you can't hide you're going to get it everybody's going to get it just make sure you're well your system is well built your body is fire retarded that it doesn't erupt in flames okay got it do you add any other things for example do you uh, believe that ivermectin should be taken or colchicine as you would talk about or- i i do give colchicine as a prophylaxis to many Today. people hmm. especially those who are who are at high risk uh i've done i've done a kind of an anecdotal work where i've one group of patients i've kept them only on vitamin d other group of patients i've kept them on colchicine and a third group of patients i've put them on both they all seem to do really well so it really doesn't matter about which which one i don't use ivermectin on a on a prophylactic basis uh, unless it's a very high exposure like you know somebody who's a storefront manager or storefront uh, employee or somebody who's a bank uh, teller who's seeing customers literally face to face or somebody who's a you know anybody a bus conductor who's taking tickets so anybody like that I'll probably advise them to to take to take an ivermectin once a week once in 5 days or once in 7 days again because i believe that the median time to incubation is 4. 5.2 days and i work with a 4 to 7 day range of 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 
from time of infection to the time of symptoms when when they show up. So at that time, if you get them, I treat very early. The first day they come to me, they get they get colchicin, they get uh, ivermectin for two days, they get colchicin for 30 days, they get clopidogrel for 30 days. So I treat very early. I don't tell them go home and wait. Okay, and I'll I'll give some tips as we talk about the Delta variant as to how I approached how I change my approach from a day by day to the Delta thing. Okay, and okay. I think uh, let's move towards that. So the so that is on the uh, keeping yourself as healthy as possible, as protected as possible. Right. Somebody who has uh, symptoms, you suspect they are COVID positive. What is your management approach to your patients? Uh, straight away, they get they get they started get started off on colchicin, uh, two you know 0.5, which means two tablets of 0.5. We get 0.5 milligrams here, so one milligram in the morning, half a milligram at night, and they get they get ivermectin for two days, uh, 12 milligram in the morning, 12 milligram in the afternoon, and the evening, uh, 12 milligram the next morning and the next evening, and it's done. I'm done with that. I do it on an empty stomach for various reasons. I seem to have had good success doing it on an empty stomach. Uh, even though there's, there's a lot of people believe doing it on a full stomach is very different. Uh, the, the belief I have is that to get the maximum absorption uh, into the nose and the throat and the blood and all, empty stomach is probably the best way to go. If you're looking for intestinal, uh, intestinal increase in concentration of ivermectin, you do the full full stomach or the fatty meal so that you slow down that and let it get absorbed into the tissue, into the into the uh, intestinal tissue, because you know that's what in, uh, ivermectin was designed for. Here we are using it for two days to prevent the replication of the virus. Beyond that, it it you know to me I it has a very limited role in my in my view for so my view colchicin and the anti-inflammatories including dexamethasone as and when required, whether it's methylprednisolone or dexamethasone as and when required uh, as a backup is what I use. Mubin? Got it. Thank you very much. So um, one thing I wanted to ask before the whole management, the COVID Delta, Delta started from India, or at mm -hmm. least discovered in India, correct. In and the rapidity of it, the lethality of it. What is your observation about Delta? It's a very contagious virus. It's If one person gets it, the whole family will get it. The whole two families have got it. Whole four families have got it. They get together for a function, everybody's sick. People go for a marriage function. Everybody of the 50, 50 uh, attendees have got COVID. Okay, And this is proven COVID. I'm not even talking about suspected COVID. This is proven COVID. Okay, so these things can happen. Uh, in the history of virology, if you follow virology, okay, as viruses mutate, they get weaker, they get less virulent, they get less potent, they get more contagious, but they do not get more lethal. They don't kill you. They don't get they don't give you the symptom that you that you would normally get with the earlier versions of the virus. However, with COVID, COVID is still remains a 14-day disease, and I work on the 14 days. So with Delta, what I did is if somebody came to me with a history of fever of, I'm just using a number of, say, 100 or 101 degrees Fahrenheit, but his oxygen saturation was below 95, let's say it was 89, he's probably a day 9, day 8, 9, or 10, because you can't get uh, oxygen saturation ratios below, below 95 on day three or four. So, I mean, if this is a COVID virus, okay? So so my suggestion to, to lots of doctors in the world who, uh, who reach out to me about what are the tips to manage, manage COVID, I mean, particularly the Delta variant, having worked with the Delta here, is that you add the four days to the history that the patient gives you. And if the oxygen saturation is below, 80, uh, below 95, be aggressive. Treat them like in day eight, nine, or ten. You, the patient, will survive. I mean, that's that's the way I approach it, and that's why I've had success with Delta. And I'm looking at it in hindsight today, okay? Because the whole wave is behind us, 
and uh, so in hindsight i can give you a lot of but when you are in the in the fight you are reacting to information you are given and intuitively i would say this is a day 9 this is a day 8 this is a day 10 and just start with whatever i start start with an oxyparin which is lovenox okay start with dexamethasone if i have to or betalprednisone if i have to uh start with of course colchicin is the base so first day whether they are eight, seven eight nine or 10 they're going to get the three the three drugs the uh colchicin ivermectin and clopidogrel okay based on the oxygen saturation i may add an oxyparin which is lovenox i may add steroids if they're really low if they let's say they they are at 60 or 75 or 85 i'll probably add some steroids to it to i do both the selective bombing and the 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 carpet bombing so i do select uh, both sides because you got to hit them really hard to bring them back otherwise that clotting because the cytokine storm happens around day 8 and 9 7 8 9 if you don't attack them and don't stop the cytokine storm you're going to have clotting if you have clotting it's going to accelerate pretty fast and the, the only thing with covid is stop that clotting okay if you stop the clotting now i'm talking of respiratory covid and i'm going to talk about two types of covid that i've seen as i've looked at my data now now that i have time to look back at patients what i've seen there are two types of covid one is that hits the lungs where you get the the cytokine storm causes clotting in the lungs the other one is it hits your brain central nervous system and the gut so it is mainly a nervous system along the gut so you're vomiting nausea diarrhea loose motions everything comes and colicky pain comes because of the the inflammation of the neurons in the gut the nerve endings in the gut the the whole autonomic nervous system gets affected so two you know i i know people call use it use call call it the word constitutional covid and respiratory covid uh i just say it's a central nervous system covid versus a respiratory level covid the second one the central nervous system or the constitutional covid may end up with long covid that's the that's the concern with that because you won't have the lung issues you won't have the things you may go slow on the treatment but they will come back to you 3 months 4 months later with continuing nerve pain continuing uh, muscle pain headaches uh, brain fog and all that so that's something people need to watch out for mobe got it i want to ask this so of course there there is a belief in a larger set of healthcare professionals that it is a virus and and having medicines that can take care of a virus are difficult and there are medicines like maybe remdesivir that may be of any help otherwise things are not useful my mm-hmm. my question to you other than maybe vaccines my question to you when you're thinking about colchicin or you're thinking about iver or other medicines are you attacking the virus or the pathology what is your uh, thinking behind the management and how is your success look like is this all a Uh, and uh, pardon me for saying it this way is this all a fluke or if you compare your success or your uh, practices outcome to someone else again this is not a study uh, how do you see that you are successful and you are on the right track okay here yeah. i i try to stop the 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 effects of the virus i know that the virus the body if if you if you boost up the body the body will take care of the virus over time 8 days or 9 days there's there's technically no live virus okay day 9th i've gone to people's homes i brought the patient out of their room i said forget your in room isolation come on out we'll you know come on we'll have a coffee cup of coffee we eaten and drunk with them the whole family is happy the rest of the family doesn't get sick okay then that may be also because i treat the rest of the family prophylactically i treat them with colchicin and ivermectin and all to clean up potentially any uh, live virus that may, they may have but assuming that the patient still continues to have virus on day 10 11 12 13 14 if you bring them out of isolation logically they should they should be passing by live viruses to other people in the home and infecting other people that doesn't happen so 
it bears it bears out my my experience bears out the fact that there's no live virus after a particular date you can fight whether it's 8th or 9th it doesn't matter i've done both and i've made sure so my thing is stop that clotting if you if the lungs are starting to clot so i start with stopping the clotting stopping the clotting stopping the clotting reducing the inflammation why i use something like colchicine is because it works really well with your anticoagulants and that's one of the reasons why i go with colchicine and i can give you a write up i can put it on your you know you can put it up on the on the thing on the screen if you want later we can come back and do a talk only on colchicine but the 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 it it's born out my approach is born out by the success i've had with patients and i deal with with corporate patients they can buy healthcare anywhere in the world anywhere in the country okay but they follow what i say they they respectfully follow what i say they do what i tell them and their family members don't get sick and that's the most important thing at the end of the day it's all about success if you can stop somebody from landing up in hospital and you help reverse them or turn them around especially if they are worse and there's no beds or something like that you can turn them around you can do you can do wonders uh today today i i i mean not today L last week i designed a protocol a treatment protocol a prophylaxis pro protocol for a country that cannot get ivermectin so i use two things colchicine and vitamin d for prophylaxis i use colchicine vitamin d uh Uh, clopidogrel for treatment and you know so so doctors from different countries are reaching out asking what do i do on this and what do i do on that uh some countries you can't get these these medicines all the medicine you can get these other ones colchicine is available clopidogrel is available all are available aspirin is available rivor rivorexaban is available um everything is available so you use the concept is stop the clotting the concept is stop the inflammation Okay, use fluoxamine. Uh, last time I hadn't had much experience with fluoxamine. I've used a lot of fluoxamine in the post-COVID scenario. Scenario, I've not used much fluoxamine in the acute COVID scenario. But you know, if somebody really has brain fog on day nine, I'm going to give him fluoxamine. I'm going to start him on fluoxamine. So it's all it's all about the patient. At the end of the day, each patient presents differently, and it. when you it's intuitively you know I I, I mean. that's the approach i take yeah there was a study that said that corona viruses if you use uh, steroids they a clear less regular virus say so let's say up to day 7 8 when you are managing a patient what is your approach at that time if you find someone who is within this time or within the viral phase if you will and do you use steroid at that stage as well or do you have a specific uh, approach to using steroids i use steroids on day 8 onwards i don't use steroids in the first week i avoid steroids uh, totally in the first week okay cool. i i would rather just go with colchicine ivermectin clopidogrel for the first 7 days it's only day 8 9 and 10 will i'll go with steroids got it cool so the first 7 days of the viral phase no right. steroids then post viral phase steroids are added as well and now if we go towards um i do not know if you are managing patients in the icus or not if no. not i'm going to go towards post covid mm -hmm. so post covid let's say i have become recovered my symptoms were there you managed me i came out of it i'm all good however i come back to two weeks later and i say now i have brain fog or i am not able to um, see correctly or i have tin tinnitus and you suspect that i may have covid long haul how do you start managing me at that time okay let me let me let me wor work with you on this question, not me i was just yeah. using myself as a as an example yeah let me let me work with you on on definitions i define long haul as beyond 6 months i define post covid beyond 30 days acute covid is really two parts first 14 days and then the first 30 days okay so for me if you are on day 20th you're still in the acute covid phase okay uh when you get past the the 30 days then you really go into the post the post covid phase i call it post covid sequelae okay 
and then the long haul will be anything beyond six months. Uh, I treat right up front, I treat for 30 days. So I don't hesitate to treat somebody for 30 days. People ask me, why should I take it so long? If you want to avoid long haul COVID, you want to avoid post COVID, please take it for 30 days. Most of my patients have recovered with that 30 day treatment. I very rarely have had to go beyond 30 days. Yes, there's a group of patients that 20% of patients or 25% of patients who will come back to you with, and who you will have to continue treating them for 35, 40, 50, 60. You know, I've treated somebody as long as 180 days, but I, I protect them from going to long haul COVID, which is beyond six months. I've never had any of my patients come back to me beyond six months. And that's, that kind of a, is indicative of the early treatment and complete treatment for the 30 days. So if somebody comes to you day two, three, four, five, six, seven, plan to treat them for full 30 days. If they come to you with day eight, nine, 10, you still plan to treat them for the balance of the 30 days. Then you follow it up and you go with, with what you need to do. Make sense? Robin? Definitely makes sense. Absolutely. So then uh, let's say long haul. So we're talking six months onwards from your definition and the patient comes in. What are your observations for possible symptom sets, categories and treatment categories for long? Are they all treatable by one set of medicines or do you have to adjust based on uh, various type of categories? How do you see long haul? If it's a symptom related to, a, to the central nervous system, anyway, central or peripheral nervous system, the nervous system in general, okay, muscle pain, body pain, uh, leg pain, a very shooting pain down the legs, back pain, okay, or headaches, tinnitus, uh, brain fog. For brain fog specifically, I use fluoxamine, okay. Anybody with a history of brain fog will get fluoxamine. My standard post COVID treatment is is uh, colchicine, dexamethasone, colchicine for full 60 days, dexamethasone for 15 days. So I do a five day, five day, five day course. So it's a step down course. Basically it's for five days. The rest of it is stepping down. And, and I may or may not add diclofenac, which is an anti-inflammatory for, which is good for muscle and for, for nerves and all peripherally. I may or may not add cetrazine, okay, to prevent your ma mast cell activation syndrome. Okay, so, so again, it all depends on what the patient presents with. I will use dexamethasone strongly if somebody has colicky pain, abdominal pain, bloating in the, in the, in the stomach, in the abdominal area, vomiting or nausea, uh, loss of taste and smell, continued loss of taste or smell. Sometimes you get one or they'll get a strange smell. You know, I keep hearing stories about, oh, I'm getting this kind of smell. I used to like bananas. Now I can't stand. They're all rancid bananas. I had a gentleman who talked to me about, you know, my biggest problem now, and it's uh, four months, three months or four months down down the, from his first symptoms. Okay. Uh, yeah. About four months. His biggest complaint is I can't smell and taste my whiskeys, my fine whiskeys. So I, I joked with him. I said, I didn't bring old monk rum, you know. And, and uh, then I said, okay, let's treat you for, for post-COVID. And hopefully he recovers pretty well. But, but again, people have very different uh, uh, complaints. Hmm. They, their complaints are not the same. So you've got to recognize each of these complaints. Is, where does it end up with? If you've got tinnitus, it's the brain. If you've got loss of taste and smell, it's the brain. If you've got muscle pain, it's peripheral nerves. It's, if you've got... Uh, uh, colicky pain in the tummy, in the abdominal area, and you have loose stools, still have loose stools three months down the road or six months down the road, you have a problem. Fix that. It's the nerve endings in the in the intestine, in the intestine wall that misfire. If they misfire, you're going to have colicky pain. And so, so again, it all depends. If you know, if you know what to expect and you can relate that symptom or the complaint, to which part of the body and what can go wrong in that part of the body, you can e actually easy, pretty easily treat that. The Got generals, it. the general drugs I use are colchicine, dexamethasone, uh, diclofenac, and cetrazine. I will add fluvoxamine if it's a brain-related issue, but otherwise, you know, these are the four that I use. Got it. So on the brain-related issues, this is 
my most common complaint that I've been hearing, uh, tinnitus and the anosmia okay. or issue with the smell. So if these are the specific conditions, somebody has anosmia, do you have some specific uh, approach to these two or this is fluvoxamine as you do for the remaining neurological symptoms? I would use colchicin, uh, dexamethasone, fluvoxamine. And I use fluvoxamine 50 milligrams BD or twice a day for 15 days. I use colchicin, uh, two milligr I mean, one milligram morning, half milligram in the evening. Uh, I may go more depending again on severity of the symptom uh, for a short term and then go back to my regular. But I will use that for six months, for 60 days. Dexamethasone, again, it will be a 15 days and then you know, five days, five days, five days. So you taper it off. And I seem to get results. I seem to get good results. So, Got you it. know, it's, it's, it seems to work. This combination, the cocktail of drugs I use seem to work really well in, in Got it. all areas of COVID. Okay. Got it. So in the comments, I am hearing something that we heard last time as well. And that was that we talked about various drugs over the whole session and so for, for folks to pick up what drugs you, what is your general approach? Let's say if I'm a healthcare worker in India and I'm trying to figure out what is your approach, there is not that approach in one place. So if you don't mind, if I asked you the summary, so let's say uh, acute COVID, first seven days, what are the drug names? The first seven days, the drug names would be Colchicin, Clopidogrel, which is Plavix in the U.S. and most parts of the world. Uh, you'll, you, I will use Ivermectin for two days. And Ivermectin has many brand names. Okay. I would use Diclofenac. Uh, so I'd use that either with a muscle relaxant or plain. And I'd use Cetrazin. Cetrazin is Zyrtec. I don't know what Diclofenac is. I'm guessing it is Wovran, right? Got it. I don't know what the brand name is. I'm guessing it is Wovran. So, so that's what I'd use for the first... In, if somebody comes to me in the first seven days. Got it. And then I, eight I, I do full, full time, yeah. Yes, Mobin, sorry. Eight onwards, the day eight onwards. It's the same drugs you add, depending on oxygen saturation, you add um, uh, enoxyparin, you add, which is Lovenox, you add dexamethasone or methylprednisolone. Okay, depending on what steroid you want to use, different people. I prefer dexamethasone. I'm very comfortable with dexamethasone. I go with, with dexamethasone. Okay, so so those are the two that I add. And, you know, the rest of it is, remains the same. So it's all about the cocktail of drugs. Yeah, got it. Long COVID, post six months, neurological category. Uh, long COVID, post six months, I'd use colchicin, dexamethasone, fluvoxamine. I don't think I'd use anything else unless there's some other some other indication in the in the abdomen or anywhere else. Got it. So long COVID, post six months, abdomen, GIT right. symptoms. If you have GI GI symptoms, then you you end up actually trying to control it by controlling the symptoms, which may be lopramide or imodium. Uh, for vomiting and nausea, you want to improve the vomiting and nausea. Then you give them. Uh, uh, Prochlorperazine, which we call stematil here. So, uh, so this is some ways of doing the symptomatic approach. But then the basic drugs remain the same. Got it. Okay. Long COVID, post six months, uh, fatigues and tiredness and and those symptoms, muscle pains. Colchicin, uh, dexamethasone, uh, diclofenac would be the three that I would use. Got it. Thank you very much for these summaries. I think these are going to be very useful for whoever um, is looking to manage their patients. One last question. Yeah. Actin is anti-inflammatory. Uh, it, mm -hmm. it reduces the assembly of microtubules. Right. There are many other anti-inflammatory as well. Steroids are anti-inflammatory plus immunomodulators or suppressants as well. Why colchicine? Why colchicin? Uh, colchicin has, I mean, I can go into the whole mechanical action. I'll have to pull up my, my slides. But, you know, colchicin has, ha, huh? What, if you like, you can. Absolutely. Uh, 
uh, let me see if I can get. I I, I didn't plan to to do to do the. We can do a separate discussion. session about that. Just yeah, let's do a separate it. session on that. Yeah. yeah, we'll talk about cautious in more detail on that. Yeah, got it. Okay, so so, so cautious in has worked for me as a great anti-inflammatory because it, it it tends to prevent the the clotting. It tends to reduce the macrophage or the neutrophils going. You know, so there's a whole bunch of theory that I've been been talking about. You know, so 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 I you know we, we'll do a se separate session on that. Yeah. Got it. So then one more question. I think this is important. Uh, majority of the people with vaccines fare okay. They have some side effects. They go away and they're fine. But in some cases, after vaccine, there are some lingering side effects as well. Do you number one encounter such patients, and number two, if you do, how do you? Uh, advise your patients and how do you manage them? Early, earlier, earlier, I used to I used to tell patients not to take any medicine other than uh, paracetamol or Tylenol uh, as a post post vaccine to just to to take care of the fever or the body pain and all that. Uh, today, I'm at the stage where I tell people who are high risk, anybody, women. Anybody who's potentially diabetic, potentially can have a clotting episode. I tell them to take colchicine for three to five days before the vaccine and five to seven days after the vaccine. So that that chance of even that remote chance of clotting can be taken care of. So anybody with any chance of clotting, uh, you know, if you give them colchicine, that that will go away. Personally, when I took my vaccine, I I was all, already on colchicine. I just upped my dose for three days and before the vaccine, took the vaccine and then went regular course of, you know, one milligram morning, one half a milligram at night for five days. And I had symptoms for, for half a day or maybe three quarters of the, of the first the day, one after the vaccine. So, you know, so this again, it's about taking care of your, you don't want to suppress your body from developing antibodies to the vaccine, but you want to suppress the chance of clotting. Okay, you really want to suppress the chance of the body going into a, uh, a super overdrive of the body's immune response system. Kind of a, you want a fire retardant, and cautious is a great fire retardant. Got it. Thank you so much. So I think that we have gotten majority of your approach. Any uh, any advice to healthcare professionals? who are managing patients, maybe they're new. For example, I have many medical students who just became doctors when start going to the hospitals. Any advice, your um, summary of how you would like them to approach and manage their patients for COVID? Treat, treat patients early. Do not tell them to go home and wait till they collapse and then come to hospital. Give them medicines. If you have the license to practice, if you have the license to give colchicine or give uh, dexamethasone or give diclofenac, or give them something to reduce the inflammation, give them something to, to stop that clotting. It'll make a big difference to their, their short term and long term uh, results that they may have. Okay, so that's because th this approach has worked for me since May of last year. And I haven't changed my approach. I haven't changed my approach. I haven't changed my, my dosages. Uh, I've just changed for Delta. I changed only the number of days where I actually will add up depending again on the oxygen saturation ratio fall. So if somebody is at day one or two or three or four, it's pretty easy. Put them on on the on the acute COVID treatment protocol that I follow. And it's it's it was we talked about it last time we're talking about it today. Put them on that. They will not have the they will not go into the clotting phase. I realize one thing if you come day one to four the chance of, of a patient going, if a patient comes day one to four, the chance of a patient going into the clotting phase or into acute, you know, where they need to be hospitalized is almost down to zero. Okay. It's where the patient comes to you day seven or eight. At that time, you have no choice. You've got to take with all guns blazing, you've got to fix that problem. And sometimes you just got to give up and say, okay, I'm going to admit this patient. And I have no hesitation admitting the patient if I believe that I can't take care of the patient. Because at the end of the day, I want to do what's right for that patient. This is not about protocols and all. This is what are we doing which is right for the patient? What are we going to do which is right for the patient? Everything the patient is the number one priority in this. Okay? Got it. Wait. Thank you very much.
So um, if you have some more time, I will take some questions from the audience here as well. So cool beans, when you ask, ask questions, please uh, avoid questions that are like, uh, I need an advice. More uh, general questions are something that we can talk about. So here, uh, there is a question from Angeline. Has Dr. DeMello treated kids with COVID? If so, what is his protocol for kids? I've treated a lot of kids. I've treated, if you've treated 8, 10,000 patients of COVID, you're going to have 1,000 or 1,500 or 2,000 patients will be kids, okay? So yeah, the youngest kid I've treated is three days old. Mother's breast milk, no medicines other than some syrup for, for fever. Mother's breast milk took care of everything. Mother was treated. Mother was COVID positive. The mother was given everything. The child did not need anything. Anybody, any, any child who's on, on breastfeeds doesn't need separate medication because the, the mother, if you treat the mother, the child automatically gets treated. Now let's talk about children between the age of two and, and 10. I do use colchicine. I do use a very low dose ivermectin, very low dose ivermectin for maybe one time or two times in case I need to uh, get rid of the virus. Okay, I'll use some antipyretics to reduce the, the, the fever and maybe the body pain, but you know, a low dose colchicine, a tablet, a half a tablet a day does enough of good for a child, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 years old. It does really well. Anybody above 10 to 15, they get, they get three quarters dose of what an adult gets and anybody above 15 is treated like an adult. So yeah, I've, I have treated a lot of children. I've admitted one child. And that too, because that child, this young girl, two-year-old girl had red toes or what do you call Hashimoto's disease. So she had red toes. One look on a video call, I said, you know what? Admit this patient to the pediatric uh, hospital because I don't want to take the chance of, of having her worsen at home. So by admitting her, she was in the hospital for seven days or eight days. She recovered very well. And sometimes you got to say, OK, I know when to hold them. I know when to fold them. I know when to walk away. I know when to run. The rest no. of the song as well. <laughs> so very good. Thank you. This is actually very wise. Um, Ro Robin Huber says, do all patients have fever or have patients with some symptoms with no or low temperature? People will complain of fever. It doesn't necessarily mean that the temperature is 100 degrees or more. They feel warm. They feel unusually warm. They feel like they're hot. And when you take their temperature, they're actually 98. OK, so it's not that. Yeah, they can have diarrhea. Other symptoms are diarrhea. You can have a running nose. You can have sore throat. You know, I've got a, a frog in my throat. I get a common question. I've seen patients with uh, uh, tonsils with, you know, big, big, uh, the the tonsils were actually like red, big red strawberries, okay? And they had, I call it craters in the mouth, but they had ulcers, large ulcers in the mouth. The first time it threw me off, I didn't know what it was. The second time I knew exactly what it was and I knew how to treat it. So again, symptoms, every patient shows up with different symptoms. You can have eye, just one symptom, red eyes. What do you call pink eyes, red eyes, you know? That's headache, body body pain, backache. Somebody just had backache. Uh, there's a guy who came to see me the other day. He had he said I'm getting pain from from my midrib all the way up to the to the uh, arm and then down the arm. Uh, so it's like you know you have you have uh, you know probably myocarditis and we're going to treat you for COVID. You're probably post COVID. You're not 14 days and is. His test came negative, but his antibodies came positive. So again, it all depends on how you how you've got to listen to the patient. You have to ask the right question. You've got to listen to that patient. That patient will tell you the story. If you listen, you spend the three minutes, four minutes, five minutes listening to them. I I go one step further. I, I actually ask patient to write down on a WhatsApp message or an email message. What are the symptoms? So because when a patient writes, he'll give you he or she'll give you the full story. It's very easy. One read of it, you know what it is. OK, so that's so that's how it is. Yeah, Mubin. got it. Thank you. My question, do you um, and in India generally, do the doctors use monoclonal antibodies or polyclonal antibodies like Regeneron in outpatient setting? The answer is no. 
Uh, they use it in the hospital setting. They have used towards the last part of the 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 wave two, uh, which sometime in June or end of May they started using the monoclonal antibodies in certain hospitals, but it wasn't widespread. Okay, and I'm I'm told in the U.S. now it's being used in an outpatient setting. I don't think I want to attempt to use it in an outpatient setting in India. It's it it needs a certain level of skill from the nurse, from the from the attending physician. It takes time. So yeah, we can do it. Not that we can't do it. It's just that in, you need to be attuned and you need to have trained staff to be able to give it to them. Okay, but I haven't I've not used it so far in my outpatient setting. Yeah. Got it. Thank you very much. Um, and when I'm looking here, I'm looking at the comments. I'm not ignoring you. Yeah, so I know. I'm also looking at the comments. <laughs> yes. So there is a comment here from Radmila. She says, or he says, I think they, she's she prophylactic cultures in dose for how long contraindications? Again, not an advice to anyone. This is just educational. Yes. Uh, I've used cultures in myself since May, since April one last year. I've taken breaks of two weeks in between. Every three months or every four months, I've taken two week breaks. I've come back on it. it. Again, it depends on what sort of exposure I have to patients, what sort of exposure I have to general public. And so it, it, it all, the breaks depend on how long you want to want to take it and what. The contraindication for colchicine is kidney failure, dialysis, uh, serum creatinine being high. Those are so in those cases, I put people on I put kidney failure on dialysis patients with colchicin, but then I manage them pretty acutely. One one tablet after the uh, the dialysis session. So if they're doing the dialysis Monday, Wednesday, Friday, after the dialysis they take the tablet all three days, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and that's it. All my all my my the group of patients who I tracked. All those patients came COVID positive, antibody positive within nine months or 10 months. So, you know, that means you can actually manage such patients if you are if you are aware and you can acutely manage such patients. You can actually, you know, I won't say save them, but you can avoid them having a fatal outcome or having a very bad COVID attack or whatever way you want to put it. Okay. Got it. Got it. I'm seeing in the comments that some... Um of the audience thinks that the medicine being called out is quercetin. So it no, is no. not quercetin, it is colchicin, correct? Call C-O-L-C-H-I-C-I-N-E. Radmila had it correct. So so does Lee, Lee J, P. Lee J, yeah. Okay. Got it. And, and so, the, the other reason why I use colchicin is because it's a fantastic drug for myocardial uh, inflammation. Okay, so so today that whole thing of if you want to prevent vaccine-related heart issues, my, myocarditis, caution is a great prophylactic before your vaccine if you want to prevent that. So again, there are many reasons for why uh, I use caution. I'd probably have to do a separate session with you, Mobin, to go we'll over it. everything causes in, you know. We'll do it. We'll do a thorough discussion of the colchicine and its mechanism. Uh, Nicole says, can breastfeeding babies get antibodies from mother or even from birth if mom had COVID while pregnant? Yes, absolutely. Yes. Breastfeeding babies can get antibodies from mother or even from birth. Yes. I've had patients who got COVID in the ninth month, eighth month, seventh month. Babies have come out with antibodies. And they were tested. So yes, it can be done. It can it can happen. Okay. So I hope that helps. Yeah. Where's Lynn Johnson? Lynn, Lynn, I must say hello to Lynn Johnson here. Let's find. So IgG is transmitted from mother to her baby in the we, womb. We, we we just test COVID antibody blood test. That's yeah. all we get. The and we get numbers and, yeah. and uh, thing positive, right. not positive, those sort of things. Yeah. And IgA is in the breast milk. So right. you're good advice or good um, mechanism. <laughs> so let's see if we have Lynn Johnson or not. Looks like we don't. So Janet uh, spelled out colchicine. So here it is. So it is not quercetin. This is colchicin. Um, JMT Hero, does Dr. DeMello add any vitamins, D, C, zinc on top of his treatment regime? 
I use vitamin D. I give very high dose vitamin D. Sometimes I give 60, 60,000 units per day oral or I'll go in or have a nurse go in or have another doctor go in and give them an injection, intramuscular injection of 600,000 units a uh, day, probably three, four, five, so they don't progress to a worse case. Uh, but what I've seen, you can actually do 60,000 units a day for, for the 10 days. These patients don't get worse. And if you do, if you do uh, vitamin D plus an iron stimulant, you'll actually avoid that second week bounce back. You'll get the bone marrow to function better. Again, it's a, these are all observations that I'm giving you from what I've done, okay? So, so when I give the vitamin D injection in a bad case, uh, somebody who's oxygen reading is below 95, say 85, 90, I'll do both. I'll give an iron and give vitamin D to prevent them from going into, uh, into uh, uh, worse off scenarios. They can actually, they start turning around and you get the V-shaped recovery. So, so that's why I, Z and, I mean, the zinc and C, uh, I gave up after I think 500 cases, I stopped giving any kind of uh, 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 supplements. You know, if they are on it, I say, take it. If they are not on it, I say, don't, don't bother. It doesn't, it does not change clinical outcomes. Both these drugs do not change the clinical outcome. I also don't use antibiotics. This is a viral disease. I don't use doxycycline. I don't use azithromycin. I use azithromycin the first 200, 500 cases, thinking that it'll, it'll affect the interleukin 17A. And when I dropped it, no changes. So if it does, your clinical outcome don't change, that means it has no role. Same thing with doxycycline. I see three, three antibiotics being given by doctors. It's not. This is this is a this is not a bacterial infection. This is a viral. So you want to, and this is an inflammatory risk. So you focus on the inflammation, you focus on the clotting, you stop that clotting. Your goal has to be to stop that clotting. If you don't stop the clotting, you can give as much as you want, vitamin C or D or whatever it is, or uh, zinc. If you can't stop that clotting, nothing's going to happen. Okay. Got it. Makes sense. Thank you very much. Augie says, generally a six month old long hauler do you see full recovery without residuals? Uh, I would suspect symptoms. Uh, prednisolone versus dexamethasone. So, what is your preference? I think you said dexamethasone. And then, do you see your long haulers to recover fully? I, at least they tell me they recover fully. I I don't know if they fully fully recover. I always tell people I set expectation right up front. You've already had the long haul symptoms. You've had the nerves being inflamed. Uh, there may be nerve damage at the end of the day. Uh, even with this treatment, you can still still have a residual a nerve damage uh, because the microvascular circulation may be affected with that nerve. You could have this pain for the rest of your life. Uh, we're trying our best to make sure you don't that it doesn't get prolonged. So take the treatment now. Most patients recover pretty nicely. I've had a young guy, 27 year old guy, who came to me with mental disorder. Basically, frank mental disorder. I told him I need three months to bring him, bring him, bring him back. And I said I probably help you recover eighty percent of your thing. In four days, he was eighty percent better, and in one month, he was one hundred percent better. And in, in a month and a half, he went back to work. So again, it all depends on how you approach it. Okay, and setting expectations is very important with these patients. You're moving. Thank you very much. Dr. Sumit Kesare says, good day, doctors. Do you think novel anticoagulants can replace low molecular weight heparin? Uh, Dr. Sumit, um, uh, good evening to you. And uh, yeah, you were here last time also. M my answer to that is probably not. At least I haven't seen it. I've used uh, Rivorexaban and uh, Dabagantrin. Hasn't given me the type of uh, results that anoxaparin gives you. Uh, especially in the acute setting, if you're if you are having somebody with a 20 by 25, and uh, you know if you're in India, you'll understand what I mean by 20 by 25. The severity score of 80% of lung clotting, you need to clean up the 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 uh, pulmonary artery, pulmonary vein first before you can get to the lung tissue. So using an oxyparin helps clean up that, helps reduce that load there, and then you start looking at other things. So. Again, I use, I, 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 I'm treating a case today 
and the case today he's i think day 30 yet today they came to me day 24 or 25 okay and the guy had 100% oxygen he's had uh, he's had uh, 80 spo2 at 100% oxygen in day 25 he probably has I, he, they haven't done a ct scan on him they can't take him to the ct scan they did a chest x ray which looked pretty uh, white okay so let's assume he's a more than 20 okay 20 out of 25 so he's more than eight, more than 75% or 80% gone okay lung 4 days later and i literally pleaded with the doctor to give him uh, a 1 milligram per kilogram body weight of enoxaparin low molecular weight heparin twice a day for at least 5 7 days before he went to once a day he was giving him uh, a 60 milligram twice a day for a for a patient who weighs 125 kilos and i was asking for 120 milligrams per day uh, twice a day for uh, 120 milligrams per dose twice a day for for the next 5 days we compromised he, he got the patient on a uh, 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 60 milligrams three times a day, which means he gave 180 milligrams for a 125 kilogram guy. Today, I can tell you th that person is down to 80% oxygen. He's basically off the NIV mask. Okay. He's now what nasal oxygen. He's down to 80% oxygen. His SPO2 has gone to 94. So we've seen a constant daily improvement in the, in the patient's condition. Of course, I added colchicine also which he, he had, the patient wasn't getting. So I had a colchicin plus an oxyparin. And we saw immediate results. Basically, within 24 hours, we started seeing results. So uh, the patient seems to be on a recovery track. Again, let's see as he goes along. But I'm giving you real-life examples. I mean, I, my, my thing is I talk patients. And when you deal with patients, I'm not talking theory here. I'm talking hardcore experience from patients. So, so this is what we do. Okay, Sumit, I hope I answered your question. Thank you very much. And I would once again remind the audience that uh, Cool Beans, that this is not that these are antiviral drugs. This is taking care of the damage that is occurring so that the body is as healthy during this issue and able to take care of the virus. So these are not, um, sometimes people put comments that this is not an antiviral. These are just the rest of the body is under attack. There is inflammation going on. There is tissue damage going on. There is possibility of clotting. There is possibility of cardiac issues. So those brain issues, so those need to be taken care of. Uh, Let me use an example here. The battle is a tsunami. Okay, you get the earthquake. The virus is the earthquake. The tsunami is the cytokine storm. The damage that's left after the tsunami has hit you and gone, that is what we are trying to fix in advance or after the tsunami. I, and that, that's the example I use with my patients. I hope it helps. Very, very good example. Thank you very much. Uh, Arpan Agarwal says, Dr. Damalo, clotting issue. Do you still prefer clopidogrel over ecosaprin or can we use 75 and 75 milligram instead of rivaroxaban? You can use rivaroxaban. I still use clopidogrel. It's the cheapest one, uh, most economical, most easily available across the country in India. I, I work in India, so for me, it's the one that's easily available. Uh, so ecosprint, absolutely, I want, will not use ecosprint. And again, I go back to my first 200 cases where I saw a bounce back in week two of the platelet count to very high levels, over 450,000. The normal range is 150 to 450,000. I, in COVID, in the first week, you'll see a depression. You'll see 80,000, 100,000, 140,000, 120,000. But the bounce back, you see 7,500, I'm sorry, 750,000 or six, 650,000. That's potential for clotting. When you have so many platelets, the adhesion chances are very, very high. And you, you know, so when I saw that, I went to clopidogrel. That's why I went to clopidogrel. Okay. Dr. Sumit Kesare says, I have interacted with Dr. DeMello personally, and he's a gem of a person and very, very approachable. Thank you very much. Thank for you, sir. Your... Thank you, Dr. Sumit. K. Molier says, have you tried antihistamines? Dr. Shankara Shetty seems to have continued success with promethazine. Yes, I have tried. And yes, I use cetrazine. Uh, almost all my patients get cetrazine uh, as part of that whole initial process. Uh, have I used promethazine? Probably not. Uh, so, you know, again, each one of us have different approaches. 
and we are all successful in our own ways. And so, you know, there are different ways to treat COVID. It's about treating the issues of the tsunami, the resultant if effects of the tsunami. If you think of a tsunami and how a tsunami hits you, this is what the cytokine storm does to us, to our bodies, to the patient bodies. So try and fix the problem up front. If you can do that or do it while it's happening, you'll be your, your patient will survive. Okay. Got it. Thank you very much. Svetlana says, if no clopidogrel, can one use aspirin? So again, no personal advice here. Can you use aspirin 325 milligram plus nitrokinase instead in the first seven days? Ask your local doctor, ma'am. I, I think I'm the wrong person. You can use aspirin. I, I don't know about the natokinase plus uh, 325 aspirin. I would say ask your local doctor and, and, and use whatever they recommend for that. Okay? Got it. Thank you. Um, let's see if there are more questions. So Hugo... Lots of questions today. Lots, lots of, of questions, questions today. Of course. And um, it is a strange situation that I have to be very careful for the questions to not be personal advices. And so I have to do all of this uh, disclaimers with it. So here is Hugo post hospital treatment. And, and once again, elaborating on that, we cannot sit here and advise to a single person. We, no. uh, Dr. DeMello for his own patients, me for my own patients, wherever I practice, so wherever Dr. DeMello practice, that is the advice there. Over here, this is more of an education and information that what is a successful doctor, how is, how is he working? This may be useful for other healthcare professionals. These kind of uh, things may be useful tomorrow to get into the books to say SARS-CoV-2 should be managed this way and so on. So this is education and, and information. This is not a clinic. So. Apologies that I have to continue to explain it. Hugo says post hospital treatment and diet recommended to prevent long term issues. Post hospital treatment can be can be anything. I continue the, when they come out of hospital. I continue whatever the hospital has given them. I try and run out the clock on those. That means whatever days they need to take that medicine. Then I I start colchicine. I start anoxaparin. I start whatever I want. Uh, when they come out of hospital based again on my my evaluation of their situation but i let them finish whatever the hospital has given them and advise them five days seven days ten days and then kind of a then take over the case fully but so it's a the first part is always a combined effort but over time i make sure i take over and 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 try and treat treat the patient to recover the goal is to make up every patient recovered not to a normal situation the i i have one 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 objective uh, make the patient better, make the patient recover. Okay. Absolutely. Uh, I mean, that's the basic objective we all have. Yeah. Absolutely. So Scott Chandler says, Dr. DeMello, can I telehealth with you from the USA? You can tell you can tele consult with me. I can't give you advice. You have to, I'll give you suggestions as to how to approach a case. It is up to you to work with your local doctor to get that to get the medicines, to get the advice. To I can advise you. I can suggest to you what to do and how to approach certain things. But you really need to uh, really work with your local doctors. Okay, I I do a lot of these uh, social media requests. I get a lot of requests on social media, and we give them suggestions. Here's what I suggest. But talk to your local hospital doctor, or if you have a patient in the ICU, people say, "Can I give this? Can we do this? Can we do that?" Yes, you can. Or here's the dose I'd suggest. Here's what I would do, you know, here I can manage the patient. Now, mm -hmm. I gave you a case earlier, the guy with 100% oxygen, 80% SpO2, oxygen saturation. He's being managed by somebody else. I'm working with the doctor, with the family to start implementing some steps and he showed recovery. That gives the Got local it. doctor a very good confidence in what to do. Make sense? Got it. Got it. And this, this comment made me smile because of my continuous disclaimers. Eric, the dog said, Dr. Bean should put big disclaimer sign over his head. That's actually a good idea. I should actually get a hat that says no medical advice, informational and educational purposes only, and wear that. 
maybe Dr. DeMello for our next talk, I should send you that hat as well. So you also have it on. Uh, but that is just some light um, hearted discussion here. Uh, this is important from education that I believe that these talks will become the fingerprint of the society and the way society responded and who did what. And from here, journalists will pick up data to say this is how people treated, this is what people tried. Then medical books would have pieces to say Dr. DeMello tried this, Dr. Merrick tried this, and so on. So I think there is a benefit of uh, putting these talks out there. At the same time, we all have to be uh, wise about the content. It is information and education. Um, let's see. <laughs> so Scott is bringing the ante up or forehead tattoo, Dr. P. Sure. <laughs> Why don't you sponsor a tattoo and I'll go and get it on the, on the forehead. Excellent. Uh, Rizabit says, are you recommending anything to your patients for pre-vaccine? Pfizer studies show potential for EBV flare-ups. I had symptoms of flare with my first dose. I'm scared for the second dose. Once again, no personal advice, but do you recommend for your own patients that here you go? Yes, I do. Yes, I do. I do recommend colchicine for three to five days before the vaccine. I do recommend continuing the colchicine for five to seven days after the vaccine. It's been very useful to, to reduce some of these side effects. Got it. We have uh, Dr. Nick Ariza. He's a physician actually from Canada, I believe retired now, but very, very active and very, very, um, I really respect Dr. Ariza's approach. So his question is, are you aware of recent study showing those on whole plant-based diet are 73% less likely to get severe COVID and those on keto paleo diets, 48% more likely to get severe COVID. Dr. Nick, thank you for your question. Uh, I actually put patients on the acute COVID from day one to 14, I put them on a very strict soft food plant diet, no meats, absolutely no meats. And I go to another extreme. I also say no cough syrups. Cough syrups contain alcohol. COVID causes inflammation of the liver. The liver enzymes are raised. I don't want any further liver damage. So there are certain rules that I follow. I put them in the protocol, in the subset of the protocol as to what I want the patient to do. It includes the diet. So soft foods. We have yogurt and rice. We have dal or legumes and rice. Okay. And these are all boiled really soft. Soups. We have yellow cucumber, not cucumber, yellow uh, pumpkin soup, okay? We have all kinds of soft soups, uh, soupy foods you can have. You don't need to eat meat, and you definitely should not eat meat in the 14 days. After 14 days, people come to me, can I have fish on day 16 or 17? Can I have meat? Can I have mutton? Can I have or lamb? Can I have this and that? You can have everything, chicken and all after that. But first 14 days, 15 days, absolutely no meat. That's the diet that I follow. I hope that helps, uh, Dr. Nick. Got it. Thank you very much. Georgia Higgs says, uh, and please, Cool Beans, please put some question mark or QQQ so I can identify the questions. How much immunity do a person have after contracting COVID disease? And if the vaccine is still recommended, and if so, when is it recommended? And I believe you yourself had a vaccine after the COVID as well. Right. I... My 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 antibodies went up from 0 0.06 last May. Went up gradually every month. Okay, 0 0.6, 0 0.06, 0 0 0.16, 0 0.26, 0 0.38, 0 0.58, 0 0.78, 1.16 1 was my Christmas gift, the day after Christmas. And then in May I was at 10.8. In August I was at 15. Point something, 15.4. I after that I took the vaccine because of other reasons. I know that I know that natural infection causes natural immunity and it's the best long-term immunity. But there are other reasons for why I took the vaccine. There are restrictions on travel. There are various other things. It's about building up the immunity. You know, uh, again, I've taken, I've taken the first dose. I will take the second dose whenever it's due and we are pretty much done with it after that. So I hope that answers your question, sir. Thank you very much. <laughs> So Carol Ann says, I'm starting all my questions with disclaimer noted. Thank you very much. Uh, let's see. 
more questions. So Plavix replacement, aspirin a good replacement for Plavix? No. My answer is no. If you have no choice, take aspirin. Some blood thinner is better than no blood thinner. Uh, I like to have an antiplatelet agent to prevent the bounce back in platelets. And that's why I use uh, the, the clopidogrel. Got it. I'm, I'm just going through the questions to make sure I can. Um, is there a colchicine replacement in a country where it is not available? Colchicine replacement. Uh, there was something in food that you could have. I, I'm forgetting what it was. There's something in food that you can have, which is a colchicine replacement if, you, if it's not available. But colchicine is available in almost every country. I haven't heard of a country today where you can't get colchicine. I know and colchicine and uh, Plavix or Clopidogrel are pretty much easily available anywhere in the world. Uh, so I'd be surprised if there, if there was a country, there's, there has to be a food, food replacement for colchicine. It's a natural product. It comes from the bark of a tree, you know. Got it. Thank you. So some quick question. I know that it is almost one and a half hours. Quick questions. Um, is fish oil a replacement for Plavix? Uh, probably not. I've never used fish oil as a replacement for Plavix, no. Next question, GH. What about Ayurveda for long COVID? Uh, the question is no. I mean, I'm an allopathic doctor. I stay with allopathy. COVID is something that has not... Uh, it's been new for all of us, and we try and stay with whatever we have. And if you notice the drugs I talk about, they're very simple, easily available, old, older drugs. I don't talk of fancy new names or anything. I talk of very basic, very old, very easily available, very economical drugs. So this is how I work. Got it. Thank you. Nidhi Dhawan says, Dr. Darren, your opinion on booster jabs? Hi, Nidhi. Good evening to you. Uh, my opinion on booster jabs, here's what I'm going to say, okay, and I'm going to make this, uh, again, it's my personal opinion. I don't think we need, we should have booster jabs, okay. Taking the full vaccine should be more than enough to, to build your immunity. If you're still going to need booster jabs, you're going to end up causing more and more variants. And we want to get rid of COVID. We want to stop COVID. We want everybody to get COVID in a controlled fashion. But again, I, again, I, I don't know. I don't have an answer. But my personal opinion was I, I would not support. Today, I would not support unless I have different, uh, much more information than what I have today about booster jabs. But again, uh, let's talk about uh, the, the, let's talk about Israel. Okay. Israel is one of the most vaccinated countries in the world. Okay, in the 90s, and yet they are all getting COVID. Are they are they all dying of COVID? Probably not. Would they need a booster jab? Probably not. Okay, because once you get COVID, and if you can get your severity severity of disease down, uh, reduced, okay, maybe 50 percent, 40 percent, 20 percent. I don't care what it is, but reduce that severity of disease. Once you get that, you should be good to go for the next five years at least. I hope that helps, Lady. Thank you very much. And I want to also add this comment that natural infection, as much as it creates immunity, is very dangerous as well. This is why vaccines are more controlled immune triggers compared to natural infection. So please realize that we are not sitting here saying, go get natural infection. That is going to be better. It is. It can kill a person. Um, Muin Beer says, what about vaccine if have bad long COVID? Okay. Today, I, today I'm going to tell everybody, whether you've had COVID or not, take the vaccine. Even if you had COVID, take the vaccine. Uh, take it, move on with it. Okay. Uh, because then you're kind of equalizing the whole playing field. So if you do that, then you're, you know, Long COVID, you may, you may be surprised. I, I I mean, you may be surprised as to what the results with long COVID would be. So I would not worry about that. There are ways to treat long COVID. There are ways to protect yourself from the vaccine. Okay. This is an interesting question. 
uh, Jan Elderton says, have you used your protocol with immunocompromised patients? Uh, yes, I've used it with, with patients who are on kid, kidney failure on dialysis, uh, cancer patients, all kinds of cancers. I've had patients who have had cancers. I've had heart attacks, previous heart attacks, previous stents, previous uh, uh, valves been put in, uh, previous histories of DVT, uh, lots of different different variabilities that you see. I mean, I, I run a general practice and you're going to see all kinds of things. Uh, yeah, the, the protocol has to be modified for that and individualized to that patient. Everything I do is individualize it to that patient. I design my protocol for a patient based on that patient's condition. I, you know, sometimes two patients may look, they get the same medicine, but maybe the dates are, the number of days they get the same medicine are different. So there could be various, uh, various ways of how to change that. Got it. Thank you very much. One more question. Uh, Ravi Raj says, uh, Dr. Great talk, very useful information about blood clots. Any advice about preventing other adverse reactions to messenger RNA vaccine, such as tissue damages? You've heard me. You've heard me talk about colchicine. Colchicine is fantastic at preventing tissue damage, both in acute COVID and I'm assuming in 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 uh, in vaccine. You know, once you take the vaccine, if you're going to likely to get tissue damage, this should stop it. And again, I'm I'm kind of saying should. Okay, I've not had that much of experience with with uh, using cultures in, in the in the pre and post vaccine scenario. I'll build it up over time. I'll definitely build it up. But uh, but again, today today I think it works, and it works pretty well. Okay, got it. So a couple of comments. There was a comment that uh, that scrolled up. I do not remember who asked it, but it caught my eye. The question was, do you believe in using TMPRSS2 or protease inhibitors like bromhexin? So do you believe in them or have you used them? What is your um, thought if, about them? If somebody is on bromhexin, I won't stop them, but I don't add them to it. I prefer to use the budenicide inhaler or nebulizer if somebody has uh, throat issues, uh, breathing issues. I use I use derifilin as a bronchodilator at night in particular. So we don't get that that decrease in, in oxygen saturation between the night number and the early morning number. That can be up to six points. So yeah, I, I, I try to I try to stay with a very limited dr drug usage because I want to I want to be sure of what I'm doing. I know what I'm doing with the drugs I have. I'm I'm not going to try and use 15 different drugs in 15 different uh, things. I, I try to I I did my homework very well last year, and I've been successful with it. I don't think I want to change a winning team. Got it. Thank you very much. Two more questions. Uh, Lisa says, Colchicine is contraindicated with statins. Is this a problem when using Colchicine for active COVID infection? Uh, the answer is no. Uh, if, if it worse comes to worse, you stop the, uh, the statin and use Colchicine because you, you need the Colchicine to prevent the tissue damage, the clotting issues, everything, the inflammation in the in the acute in the active or acute COVID infection. So stop the statin for 15 days or 30 days and you can come back on statin later. Okay. Got it. Got it. And last question, Ann Walsh says, why is he using Colchicin for his prophylaxis? It's not an antiviral. Again, I, I'm I'm using Colchicin as a fire retardant as a thing to calm your body down, to prevent the body from erupting into flames. And I'm going to use fire retardant as a, as a word because most people understand that. So you want to really prevent the body from over responding to the virus or to the vaccine. So that's why I use culture. Make sense? Thank you very much. So there I saw some comments here to say, we should come back once more. We should request your time once more to talk more deeply about culture saying its mechanism of action and how it makes its uh, impact. So hopefully we can we can re request your presence once more later on as well. Sure, absolutely, sir. So thank you very much. Very, very insightful, very useful, very valuable. And congratulations for your success. At the end of the day, vaccines are important the virus our body will handle the virus but the damage that occurs there right. is importance 
for a physician to ma make sure that they can handhold the patient in a you know their tissue and their body and their health they can navigate them through this process successfully and thank you very much for being that doctor thank you for coming on it's about preventing the the bad effects of the tsunami if you can prevent those effects you can you can easily go through the tsunami and you you actually don't need it to get get into the tsunami you know you can actually suppress the tsunami okay so so that's where it is okay thank you dr okay. bean so thank you very much there is so many thanks to you from the cool beans as well so thank you for being here thank you so much sir good day okay. to you thank yeah. you same to you and cool beans uh, so tomorrow and monday monday is the labor day i'm going to be off on monday tomorrow i'm taking one extra uh, day off so i would see you all on tuesday thank you very much and stay safe and healthy bye bye for now take care